Hello, good morning, everybody. It is my great pleasure to present a speaker on site. One of a few. Uh, unfortunately, we should have more of you here on site. Uh, Michael Eckstein uh, is. Oh, thank you. Yes, of course. <laughs> yes, of course. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> so, so hello again, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Michal Eckstein. He's one of our local uh, speakers. We are very happy to have him around. Uh, he got his PhD in 2014 from Jagiellonian University, uh, where he is now an associate professor in the physics department. But your PhD was in mathematics, right? Okay, right. good. But then he had an extended romance uh, with his National Quantum Information Center at the University of Gdańsk. So uh, he will be very well acquainted with the talk of Arthur Eckert, I suppose, in a few, tomorrow, actually. And uh, he received uh, a number of uh, interesting awards from the Ministry of uh, Education and uh, Science. Um, these are very hard to get awards, so chapeau bas for these achievements. Um, he also wrote a book with Bruno Joachim, Spectral Action in non computer Geometry, which is quite impressive for a person with a PhD in 2014. Um, uh, so I, I haven't read this book, I admit, but, uh, but it's something you should look at. And uh, one thing which is very outstanding in Michal's life is his efforts in popularization of science. I'm really impressed uh, that in particular, among many other efforts like writing articles and so on, uh, he has uh, lots of popular lectures on YouTube, and uh, the number of views is spectacular. It's over half a million, okay, of, of views of his public popular lectures on YouTube. So today I have a chance to double this number, which we <laughs> <laughs> wish you very much. Um, and without any further ado, uh, Michal Eckstein, and it will be about uh, going uh, from physics to non commutative geometry and back. So it's like the title of one of his Hobbit movies, right? Mm -hmm. The end back again, right? Yes. Okay, kind of. so I will start uh, sharing the screen. And voila, here we go. Okay. You well, have your mic. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Piotr, for this very nice introduction. Uh, well, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's a great honor to, to give a lecture here. So I was asked to tell you about non-commutative geometry and physics. And to do it in and to do it in 60 minutes so i'll do my best but let me just make two disclaimers first one non-commutative geometry is uh is an advanced domain of mathematics so you really need to know well the differential geometry and functional analysis okay so what i can give you in 60 minutes is just a some kind of general idea what it's all about and why it's interesting and then second thing you need to know is about physics, that the methodology of physics is quite different than the one from mathematics. Typically, physics is much more pragmatic. So if you meet an average physicist, say, at CERN, the only thing he or she would care are the numbers, the numbers they can measure in an experiment. They don't care about structures. They don't care about metries or whatever. They just need a number that you need to measure. Now, that said, the history of science shows you a spectacular interplay between physics and mathematics and uh, inspirations that go both ways. Quantum mechanics inspired the development of operator algebras, functional analysis, uh, and, and many auxiliary fields. And on the other hand, if it had not been for Riemann and his brilliant idea of a curved geometry, then Einstein could not have written his equations. Uh, so. That's my idea of this talk, just to give you an example, the example of non-commutative geometry of how this interplay between physics and mathematics works in practice. All right, so let's get started. Uh, okay. So let me start with the slogan that physics is geometry. And uh, that's not even my claim, that's actually Plato. And uh, Plato's claim is actually even stronger. <clears throat> he says that the knowledge of which geometry aims is the knowledge of the eternal. So it's not even physics, it's metaphysics. But people took it quite seriously. And here's an excerpt from Johannes Kepler's book uh, showing uh, the, the platonic solids um, in connection to, to physics, All right? Uh, now we're in 21st century and people still take it seriously. And here's the proof. 
we have many books which treat about geometry and physics. I particularly recommend the book of, of Roger Penrose. Uh, if you're interested in mathematics, you should read this book. If you're more interested in physics, then you should read this book. If you're interested in neither, you should read this book anyway. <laughs> because it's, it's really brilliant and it shows you a, a spectacular picture of, 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 of this interplay between physics and mathematics. Okay, and otherwise you have, you have obviously general relativity, you have, uh, you have uh, quantum information, you have quantum field theory, you have many body physics, a lot of different, different subjects. Okay, but then you should ask, well, okay, so physics is geometry, but what is geometry then? <laughs> so for me, at, for this lecture, geometry means Riemannian geometry. Now, uh, roughly you can say that you have three levels of structures. First is a topological level, which tells you if your object has any hole in it or not. Uh, then you can put a smooth structure on it, and then you will see if there are any cracks on the picture or not. And then eventually you have a metric structure which allows you to determine the shapes and measure distances. And typically physicists only care about the metric structure because this is something they can measure in an experiment, okay? Okay, so now uh, one slight course of Riemannian geometry. So please forgive me if you don't know Riemannian geometry, I just try to sell you the main idea. The main idea is that a manifold is an object which is locally looks like a Euclidean space, but globally it need not be so. Okay, so typically you would need many patches, charts to, to map it. Okay, so you cover your manifold with coordinate charts, and then you need some transition functions between these, these two charts. And well, depending on what you want, you can just consider them to be continuous functions or you want them to be smooth functions as you do in, in smooth geometry. Okay, so this gives you the, so these patches together, they form an atlas and there's a certain maximal atlas. And if there's a maximal smooth atlas, you have a smooth manifold. Okay, the second important feature is a tangent space. So if you have a, a manifold, then at any point of this manifold, uh, you can have a tangent space, um, which is just a homomorphic to, to Rn. Okay, so these are just vectors at this point. And then, then you can equip your manifold with, uh, with many different structures, with tensors in particular. And uh, a particularly interesting tensor is a metric tensor, uh, which is some bilinear symmetric non-degenerate form which as you see, is depend, it's defined on the tangent space and it depends on, on your point X. So typically it would vary from one point to another, okay? And if you have a metric tensor, you can measure distances. That's what physicists want and that's what physicists do. So if you have two points, you look for curves which link these two points, okay, with a sufficiently smooth or at least differentiable. And then you compute its tangent vector at every point you compute this, this integral, uh, that's the length of the curve, and then you take the infimum over all possible curves. And this gives you the distance, that's the geodesic distance. Okay, uh, so now back to physics. Why manifolds are nice? Because our universe is actually a manifold. Okay, so Einstein equations are equations for the metric tensor. Okay, so the assumption, the big assumption is that, well, our entire universe is, is a manifold. It's a smooth Riemannian manifold uh, with a certain metric tensor. And now our only goal is to determine this metric tensor from empirical data, from, from measuring of cosmic microwave background and stuff like that. Okay, and that's how the expanding universe arises. Okay, so uh, one important thing here is that the universe is not really a Riemannian manifold, it's a pseudo-Riemannian manifold because it's not a space, it's a space-time, which means that this metric is, well, it's not really a metric because it's not positive definite, but it has a signature with one minus and, and three plus, or one plus three minus, that's equivalent. And uh, this leads to a causal structure. So, uh, well, you have a speed of light, so the limiting speed, which, uh, which tells you that, well, there is a limiting speed in the universe and this, well, this changes a lot, okay. 
but otherwise that's that's the same structure i mean you you can you can do pseudo riemannian geometry almost as if you did with the with the usual riemannian geometry all right so that's the big word the macro scale now what happens at microscopic scales well it is quite different there firstly because quantum particles well they do not have definite trajectories well at least not not always and that's a that's a famous double slit experiment so if you put just one photon through a slit it will go both to both of these holes in a sense or to neither of these holes in another sense if you wish but it's not like it goes to one way or another and uh, you will only know when you measure it at the end on the screen so a single photon will just give you one dot here uh, but if you put many of them then they will interfere and you will get this famous interference fringes okay and this is a non-classical effect okay so that's the first problem you don't have trajectories so well you cannot really think in terms of curves on a universe manifold okay and the second problem um, is the existence of complementary variables for instance uh, the position and momentum of the particle they are complementary variables okay in terms of mathematics they do not commute which in terms of physics means that they don't have a common probability distribution and this is exactly the statement of heisenberg's uncertainty principle saying that well you can measure position as accurately as you want and the same goes for momentum but if you want to measure both simultaneously then there is a bound and this bound is given by the by the Planck constant okay uh, and uh, yeah well uh, so uh, as you see if you don't have trajectories well we don't have the the usual observables so what do we have well first of all we have uh, vectors in a hilbert space so uh, you have a quantum system which is let's say in a pure state it's described by a vector in a hilbert space so adam told you about hilbert spaces um, two days ago uh, so then if you want to measure something you need to look for an operator on this hilbert space of quantum states a self-adjoint operator because self-adjoint operators have real spectra and uh, well in an experiment you always measure real numbers at the end of course you can debate whether they are real or or maybe just rational or so but it's not a complex number anyway uh, so you need to deal with self adjoint operators okay so as you see it's this it is very different from let's say from the classical world from, from riemannian geometry trajectories uh, or clouds of dust stuff like that uh, okay so the natural language for quantum mechanics is that of algebras well, I believe that Francesca will tell you more about operator algebras on, on Friday. So I will just quickly flash through. So uh, an algebra is just a complex vector space. So I will consider algebras over complex numbers. You can consider it over any field, but uh, yeah, complex numbers are, are nice. And if you don't believe me, then go to Roger Spenrose's book. Okay, so you have a vector space, then you have a, equip it with a multiplication. Uh, you equip it with an involution, okay, which needs to be compatible with the multiplication by scalars and this multiplication in the algebra. And then you have a complete norm on it, okay? And uh, that's a, that would be a Banach algebra. And for sister algebras, we have an additional property, which is this one, okay? Now, we'll mostly focus on so-called unital sister algebras so just algebras which have a unit okay you can do something more general without a unit there's always a called approximate unit but unital algebras are nice so let's stick to them okay so this is quite abstract but then comes Gelfand and Dymark who tells us that actually every sister algebra is isometrically star isomorphic to some closed subalgebra of bounded operators on some Hilbert space Okay, so if you know bounded operators on, on a Hilbert space, well, you know sister algebras. And uh, what's very nice is that this proof is constructive. So we have an explicit construction that's called the Gelfand-Neimark-Siegel construction, which tells you, well, how to do it, okay? 
have an abstract sister algebra. And so this is essentially about the theory of representation of sister algebras. You represent them on a Hilbert space, okay? Example, simple example, the matrix algebra. So if you just take matrices of your favorite dimension with a standard matrix multiplication, you define the evolution to be the conjugate and transpose of a matrix. And then you put a, you put a supremum norm on this. So that's the, so you see that's just the operator norm. So that's the operator norm on, on the algebra of matrices, the one that Adam showed you days ago. And you can re-express it in terms of a square root of the maximal singular value of X. Okay, and this is a nice finite dimensional sister algebra. And in fact, you can show, that's the better bird theorem, that any finite dimensional sister algebra arises from direct product of, of matrix algebras. Okay, sir? Direct sum. Direct sum, sorry, direct sum, yeah. Um, okay, and well, matrices are nice, for instance, for quantum information. That's, that's the field I, I work in right now. Mm. So if you just take the simplest example of two by two matrices, well, they define for you the spin algebra. So, uh, and the spin of a single particle is a, it's a qubit. So that's, the, that's like a quantum version of a bit. So the, the, element, the elementary quantum information. So every qubit is a normalized vector in C2. And this you can represent it as a point on a sphere. So that's sometimes called the block sphere. Okay, and then, so as you see, you have many more options for a qubit than a bit. For a bit, you just have zero and one. For a qubit, you have the whole sphere. Okay, and then you can take any observable, so any, any Hermitian matrix, two by two matrix, then you can make a measurement and then you get some expectation values, et cetera, et cetera. So Rim, I have yeah. a question. So uh, this notion of measurement is just kind of black box, yes? It's not defined mathematically, yes? What is the precise uh, value of this measurement, yes? Well, the value of the measurement... Um, you have yeah, an I mean, observable, so, so you let, have a state, that, and then yeah. what, what you are given is only the probability distribution, not yes. the out, yes. uh, pre precise outcome of this measurement. Yes, yes exactly. So that's, that's the phrase I was going to read. So <laughs> that, uh, okay, you just consider the, an effect, so an operator which is between zero and one, so that it has, has only zero and one as, as possible eigenvalues. So you will get one with probability, with this probability. So that's just a, the expectation value of this observable, this effect in, in this state. And of course it, it has zero with, a, with one minus P. Okay. So, so in other words, uh, it is impossible to define the measurement as uh, a map from observables times uh, states, yes, to, to real numbers. As an actual map, you, you only know the probability that some outcome would appear. Yes, yes. So uh, more precisely, you can say that uh, any observable, it has some spectrum, mm -hmm. and these are the possible outcomes of your measurement. Mm -hmm. So the numbers that you would register at the measurement, at, at the apparatus, and then any state defines a probability measure on the spectrum of this observable. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, thank you. Okay, well, sometimes, I mean, here depends if you choose a, uh, an axis which is aligned with your state, like exactly aligned with your state, then you will get the same result with certain, okay? But it's very specific. In typical, you, you will get some, some random numbers and that's, that's quantum randomness. Okay, so uh, another example, which is, well, hopefully a motivating example, uh, saying that, well, you need to go to C-star algebras and then maybe you can get back to spaces and, and maybe geometry. So if you have any compact Hausdorff space, then you can define functions on it, say complex valued uh, with a pointwise multiplication and involution just by complex conjugation and the supremum norm, then this is a commutative C-star algebra. Okay, and in fact, yes, Well, you have to use a microphone to ask a question. Yeah. So. Okay. 
Okay, let me repeat. Uh, why do we assume that the space M is compact? Does it have to do with the supremum norm? Mm. No, not really. The supremum would work, but uh, it's just the question of the existence of unity. If you have a if you have a compact space, then uh, then uh, there is a unity in your C star algebra. If this space is only locally compact, then there is no unit, but still you can you can deal with it. And it's yeah, it's it's actually here in the Gelfand duality because Gelfand duality tells you that this is again a two-way street. So you can sure. Uh, so that every commutative C star algebra arises in this way from some. Okay, so maybe this compactness is uh, uh, due to the fact that uh, the supremum is uh, finite. Yes, if you don't assume uh, your function to vanish uh, at infinity, then you don't have. Uh, uh, you cannot guarantee that this uh, supremum would be uh, finite. Yes, but for compact, yeah. it is for yeah, for yeah. granted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but for locally compact, you can you can take functions which vanish at infinity. Okay, so they 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 are arbitrarily small outside of compact sets, and then you can you can do as usual with the supremum norm. And it's still a nice sister algebra. It just doesn't have a unit, but otherwise it's it works just fine. So this Gelfand duality is a really, really powerful tool. It's well, you can you can even define it in terms of equivalence of categories, stuff like that. I, I also have a question, if I may ask. Go ahead. So within, regarding this point of compactness of the of the Hausdorff space. Isn't this related to the case that you are working actually with the spectrum and the spectrum becomes a compact space? Yes, actually, this is the, I mean, the spectrum of the algebra, you mean? Yes. Yes, yes, actually, this, this space that M that arises here in Gelfand duality, that's precisely the spectrum of the algebra. And that's a compact set. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you're working with this M, then, then it has to be compact. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Apologies for asking. Thank you. Okay. Maybe, Michael, if you allow me, just a very quick comment. Sure. Uh, luckily, compact and compact household spaces are not so extremely different in the sense that you have a topological procedure of, say, one point compactification. So if you want one of the definitions locally compact how the space is how it behaves with respect to one point compactification and on the algebraic side, uh, you have uh, minimal unitization. So these are completely analogous procedures. Yes. And, and uh, he, he, in fact, going from the Gelfand Neimark with duality theorem for mm -hmm. compact how the space is to, to, to locally compact, that's not the big deal. Yeah. Uh, although, of course, doing analysis on non-compact spaces is much harder than doing them on compact yes. spaces. Everybody knows this. But uh, conceptually speaking, these locally compact versus compact house spaces are not so drastically different. They are the same kind of animal. That's right. and, and, and I would be more willing to say that we have an anti-equivalence than equivalence between compact house spaces and unital commutative sister algebras because the functor is contravariant. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let me just say that, well, for, for physics, we actually would prefer to, to be with the locally compact spaces because our universe, as far as we can tell, is not compact, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's only locally compact. And, uh, and that's a theorem, actually, by Geroch, saying that if you have a compact space-time, it always contains a closed causal curve. So... <laughs> Okay, anyway, uh, so right now we're just at the topological level. So the first step, okay, we want to do geometry eventually. So first thing that we need is some kind of smooth structure. Now the smooth functions on the manifold, they do not form a sister algebra because this is not complete. So the, the sequence of smooth functions can, can converge to a continuous function only. Uh, but these guys are dense in, a, in the sister algebra of continuous functions. So that's, that's good enough. Okay, it's, there's, there's more structure here. There's some locally convex topology and that's the structure of pre sister algebra, but it's sufficient to know that they are, they are dense, okay. All right, so now we are ready to, to finally go to non-commutative geometry. And so let me present you the notion of a spectral triple uh, developed by this gentleman, Alan Kohn, who got his uh, field medal, but not for non-commutative geometry, he got it for 
classification of von Neumann algebras. Even though it's a Fields medal, the guy on this medal is Archimedes, not Fields. Yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and, and Connie is this guy on the left. <laughs> Just to make sure. <laughs> okay, so as you can easily guess, a spectral triple consists of three elements, uh, typically. So we have a unital star algebra. You can take it to be a pre C star algebra. Typically you do, but well, as long as you have a faithful representation on a Hilbert space, on a separable Hilbert space, then it's, uh, it's good enough. And uh, once you have a pre C star algebra, which is dense in a C star algebra, uh, this representation this is always guaranteed because you have the GNS construction. So such a space always exists and, and you can represent these operators. Now the pivotal element is the is this operator D, which is uh, typically an unbounded self-adjoint operator on the Hilbert space. Mm, and it has two crucial um, features. The first one is that if you take a commutator with a representation of any element of the algebra, then this operator goes here. This should extend to a bounded operator. Okay. So this guy is unbounded. It has some domain. So if you just sandwich it with the, with the elements of the algebra, well, you would get usually just, a, just an unbounded operator. But the assumption is that these guys always extend to bounded operators. Okay. So at intuitive level, you can think if, if your elements of the algebra, there are functions, and this guy acts as a differential. So this commutator is just the differential of your element. Okay, so you want the differential to be, to be finite. So this is like a smooth element of this algebra, okay, or, or differentiable. Okay, the second condition is uh, the compactness of the resolvent. So this means that if you take an inverse, this guy might have a kernel or not, but if it does, you need to take a, not an inverse, but a, but a resolvent, which means that this guy is a compact operator, okay? So my ask you is a very naive, uh, simple technical question. Sure. If it's compactness of a resolvent assumption for a Hilbert space, which is infinite dimensional, does it entail that D must be unbounded? Does it entail that D must be unbounded? Uh, if, if A just yes, find I infinite so. dimension, yes. right? Okay. Yes, I think so because it's, yeah, because uh, I mean, compact operator, uh, it has a discrete spectrum with the only accumulation point at zero. Mm -hmm. So if you take the inverse of it, you have the accumulation point at infinity, mm -hmm. okay? Which means that exactly. this is an unbounded operator. Exactly. So unless you are finite dimensional, yes. that must be unbounded. Yes, that's so, right. So because you know that that's possibly unbounded. It was sort yeah, of hinting yeah. that, oh, well, it's typically bounded, sometimes might be unbounded. No, it's the other way around. It's typically yes, unbounded. Yes, it's typically and... unbounded. If your Hilbert space is infinite dimensional, it's typically unbounded. But if it's finite dimensional, well, then you don't really have a choice. It's it's just a matrix, okay? Okay, so that's that's the core. That's the basis on which you which you build your, your theory. And then you have some more technical assumptions because this is only differentiability. You then need some more commutators, which tell you that your elements are really smooth elements. Sorry, I think that you can argue also that if D, D would be bounded, then D minus lambda identity also would be bounded. And then if you multiply by this operator, which is compact, you, you will get a compact operator since compact operators form an ideal. And therefore you get that identity is compact, which is uh, not possible unless, uh, unless your uh, Hilbert space is finite dimensional. Yeah, that's, that's yet another way to state it. That's right. Okay, well, there is some notion of, of dimension. So you have spaces which are finite dimensional. You can go to infinite dimension also if you want. And you can put more structure here, so called reality structure, projective modules, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but um, so let 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 me now make an intermezzo, saying something more about where, what is this D operator? Where does it come from? Well, again, it comes from physics. So there there is a fundamental dynamical equation of quantum mechanics, which is of course the Schrödinger equation. So that's the equation for a. Uh, for a free massive particle with mass m, okay? And the problem with this equation is that it is non-relativistic, okay? And this is something that people realized quite quickly that, well, okay, if, well, if you make a Lorentz transformation, that's not going to be invariant, so that's bad for the theory. So they tried to 
write down an equation which would be Lorentz invariant. And the first guess was the Klein Gordon equation, which is a second order equation with this D'Alembert operator here. It's, it's a wave equation actually with a mass here, it's a modified wave equation, um, which is nice, but it has some problems with the probabilistic interpretation because if you define the, the density of, of, of probability, it's not always positive or it is not always Lorentz invariant. So that was not quite satisfactory. And apparently Dirac was the first to write down this equation, but immediately he was not satisfied with it. So he went and constructed his own equation. So what Dirac did was just to take a square root of this operator. And then he realized that, well, okay, if I want to take a square root of this operator, the operator that I'm going to get cannot be a scalar, but I need to enlarge my space. And this is how spinners arise. Okay, so in four space-time dimensions, uh, you need four gamma matrices or Dirac matrices, which are four by four matrices and uh, which satisfy this nice anti-commutation relation with the Minkowski metric here, okay? And uh, well, the Dirac equation is, uh, well, that was absolutely a genius idea that explained the, the spectrum of the hydrogen atom. And uh, well, it was gave birth to quantum field theory and it, it was really a major breakthrough in physics. And at the same time, uh, it led to a major breakthrough in mathematics because this Dirac equation, you can write it, well, this was for Minkowski spacetime, as you can write it on any spin manifold, which is, well, a spin manifold is, uh, it's, well, almost all orientable manifolds are spin. Sometimes there are some topological obstructions. Okay, there's something called the spin structure. But as long as you have it, you can write down your Dirac equation and the operator that sits here, that's called the, the Dirac operator, okay? And that's, that's the inspiration for, for uh, that was the inspiration for this D operator in spectral triples. Okay, and in fact, if you just take a smooth compact spin Riemannian manifold, you take smooth functions on it, and you have your spinners over this manifold, you take square integrable sections of spinners, which form a nice Hilbert space, and you take this Dirac operator, so the, the Dirac operator from this generalized Dirac equation, then you are going to get a commutative spectral trip. And then that's a, that's a fundamental result by Kohn, which, uh, well, it took him some 12 years to, to get the final version. As far as I know, the story is that the first version was, uh, well, there were some controversies around it. So Kohn worked really hard. And after 12 years, he published the final version with, with a proof, which is something like 70 pages long or so. Well, historically speaking, I remember that it was Joe Varilli who worked on this mm -hmm. theorem for a very long time, and they almost got it, but there was a gap. Mm -hmm. uh, there mm -hmm. was one step missing, and uh, uh, Alain finished it. But it's, it's, he says himself that it's one of the hardest theorems that he ever mm -hmm. worked on. Yeah, that's, that's certainly correct. Sorry, so, also, I think that uh, you need some extra assumption, yes? So if you are saying that you're spectral triple is uh, commutative, it does not only mean that A is commutative, but the whole bunch of assumptions with dimensions yes. with modules yes, yes, uh, yes, has yes, to be yes, satisfied. Yes, that's right. There are a lot of technical assumptions, which I don't list here. There's uh, the smoothness condition, the finite dimensionality, the summability and stuff like that. So it's, yeah. Yeah, there, there are a lot of assumptions here. Uh, but yeah, as long as you do it, you can prove that it's, it's a, it's a two-way street, okay? And I, I, if I remember correctly, the toughest part was to distinguish between orbifolds and manifolds. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Because, of course, you have Gelfand Nimers, you know, that it's compact yeah. house of space. But is it a manifold? And, and, and how to axiomatize it using function analysis that mm -hmm. it's a manifold, not an orbifold, mm -hmm. not a pillow with four corners, for instance. Right. That's, that's right. Okay, so let me just give you three glimpses of, of this, how, how this works in practice. Uh, so first thing is that this guy, this Dirac operator is, is a nice self-adjoint operator. It has a discrete spectrum, which well, it's unbounded, so it grows to infinity. And if you count the eigenvalues and the number of eigenvalues, which are smaller than a given lambda, then there's a nice theorem by Weil, which tells you that this grows uh, as lambda to the power n, where n is the dimension of the underlying manifold. 
Okay, so you can recover the dimension of the underlying manifold just by looking at the spectrum of, of your Dirac operator. Okay, and then what is more, you get the, the volume, which comes here, and that's why you need compact spaces and some coefficients. Okay, well, you can also say that this Dirac operator acts as a kind of a derivative. If you compute the commutator, you get something like this. Well, that's the summation over this index mu. And the norm of it is just the supremum gradient, you know, the supremum gradient. And what is more, you can actually recover the geodesic distance. That's the cons distance formula. So if you take a supremum overall functions, which uh, would have this gradient bounded, then this gives you precisely the geodesic distance, the infimum of per curves. Okay? So uh, to me, it's a very powerful result because it shows you that really you can, you can do geometry on this dual level on, on the algebra of functions. Okay, so what else? Well, you have finite spectral triples where, well, you just take your favorite matrix algebra, you represent it on a, on a Hilbert space, on a finite dimensional Hilbert space, and then you take any Hermitian matrix, uh, which is a good Dirac operator. And of course it's bounded because it's finite dimensional. Well, you can combine the two things and go almost commutative. And these guys are very important for physics which we shall see in a moment. Uh, so don't care about this. Don't worry about this gamma phi. That's the chirality operator. Just think of it in terms of a product geometry. And it's almost commutative because the commutative part is infinite dimensional and the non-commutative part is finite dimensional. So this one is much bigger. That's why it's called almost commutative. Now there, there is much more to that. Um, you can have spectral triples on graphs, on fractals, some non hausdorff spaces, uh, you have uh, isospectral deformation on commutative tori, you have uh, quantum spheres, which relate to quantum groups, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so there's, there's a lot to that. But, uh, okay, let's switch back to physics again. Uh, now we're back in 18th century, and uh, well, we have a famous Pierre-Louis Maupertuis, to claim that nature is thrifty in all its actions, uh, or otherwise that nature is lazy. And it always, the, the physics works in a way so that the, the system uses the, the least, well, it minimizes some, some quantity, okay? Not necessarily energy, but some, some quantity. It's called an action. Okay, actually, um, apparently Euler had the same idea in the very same year, and apparently Leibniz, wrote the idea like, uh, 30 years before, uh, but uh, well, it was just in a letter. So the credit goes to Mopertui anyway. So the basic idea is that, uh, well, if you have just uh, classical particles, a bunch of particles, and they, they follow some trajectories, mm, then you, have a, you can write a Lagrange function, which depends on, on this trajectory and its derivative, and it can depend explicitly on time. Then you can write down the action functional, which is this integral from some initial time to final time. And then you say, okay, I want my action to be stationary. So it's uh, slightly more general than the original idea. It need not be the least action. It can be the maximal action or the stationary ac action. And from this, you derive the Euler-Lagrange equations by variational calculus. Okay, so this gives you the, the equation of motion. Okay, so this is really probably one of the most powerful laws of physics, if you, will, if you wish, and it caused a sort of shift of paradigm in, in doing physics, because before that you need to, need to write down the equation for a system, like in classical mechanics. And now you can just deal with action, and as long as you have the action, you can, you can write down the equations. And it's actually much easier to write down an action because, well, you have symmetries and they are much better visible at the level of the action than at the level of the equation, okay? So that was really a breakthrough. And the primary interest was in classical mechanics, but then it well, expanded to almost all domains of physics and you use it in statistical physics, quantum mechanics, uh, quantum field theory, that's at the basis of the famous path integral formalism by, by Feynman and um, cosmology, etc. 
And in particular, it's of use in, in particle physics. Now, uh, that is the Lagrangian of the standard model of particle physics. Okay. It's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> That's a typical exam question, write it down. Yes, yes, yes. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's beautiful, isn't it? Now, of course, it's not. It's <laughs> It's, it's a nightmare, right? <laughs> so there are two problems. Uh, first problem is that, well, you would like to modify it somehow or understand it better, but it's heavily protected by symmetries. So although it is very, what's this sound? It is, uh, uh, well, it doesn't look very appealing, but still it's protected by gauge symmetries, Lorentz invariance, and and quantum field theory uh, renormalization stuff, which means that there's some anomaly which needs to cancel, et cetera, et cetera. It's really constrained and it's not easy to modify it in a way to not to spoil the theory, to modify it consistently. Okay, but for me, there is a second problem. I mean, which are we missing something here? Because if you look at this formula, you see, well, there should be some structure behind it maybe, or this sound. Anyway, so is there any structure behind the standard model as, as it is behind this, this nasty formula? Fair question? No? Okay. All right. And then came Ali Chamsedin and Alan Kohn in 1987, and they said that, well, the physical action should only depend upon the spectrum of of your operator D, okay? Which, well, that's, that's a quite a limiting uh, principle. It says that whenever you have a spectral triple, well, you have an action. Now, how do you implement it? Well, you take your Dirac operator, <clears throat> you need to divide it by some energy scale for physical reasons, because this operator has the physical scale of energy, it's something dimensionless. Well, this guy is unbounded, so you need to cut it off with some smooth function and then it becomes trace class and then you can take a trace of it. So roughly the idea is that as in the while low, you need to count the number of eigenvalues which are smaller than your given energy scale. Okay, well, if you want to have all your physical fields, then it's not sufficient to just take the bare Dirac operator, but you need to take the fluctuations of it. Uh, which on the mathematical side, they correspond to geometries which are unitarily equivalent to your initial spectral triple. Okay, it's, it's actually the Morita equivalent of spectral triples, but there is some notion of equivalent geometries and you need, to, you need to move within this class. Okay, so you need to consider the fluctuated Dirac operator. And then, well, uh, you very rarely know the spectrum explicitly. So you need to, uh, you need to do some, you need some method to compute it. And the standard method is to use an asymptotic expansion. So to look at what happens when lambda is large. Okay, of course, it's going to divert with lambda. Mm. And the first term of this expansion, you know that that would be the Vilo, I mean, in the commutative case. But then you might be interested in some subleading terms. Okay, Thank that's the idea. big idea. Yes? Can I ask a question? Regarding the spectral action principle, is it just a purely theoretical result or is it based on some facts from physics? Well, it's uh, actually, it is based in a sense that it, it, uh, it does relate to particle physics if you apply it to almost commutative geometry and that's actually on the next slide, so. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so then the idea is that if you now assume that we go almost commutative. So we have our space time manifold and we take a product of it with some, with some internal geometry, uh, which is, uh, well, which comes from this matrix algebra. So it's, it's a zero dimensional uh, geometry. In this sense, it's, it's different than for instance, string theory, because we're not adding additional dimensions here. We're still in dimension four. But we have some internal geometry, which is what can be highly non-trivial. Okay, now 
if you choose smartly your finite algebra and uh, some sort of and con choice is this one with the C quaternions and three by three matrices, which of course, if you know the standard model, it's not hard to guess. Why is it so? Because the standard model has the gauge group U1, SU2, SU3. So that's, that's a natural choice. Well, then you need a Hilbert space, which again, you take from particle physics, you look what are the fundamental fermions and how many of them they are. You take a suitable representation. Mm. Then you have the freedom in this finite Dirac operator. So then you can encode masses and coptic constants. And then the magic happens. If you compute the spectral action and use this asymptotic expansion, what you get is you exactly get this bosonic part of the, of the standard model, okay? And um, why this happens? Well, this happens because of the so-called Gilke theory, uh, which is related to, to heat operators and, and also index theorems. And uh, these guys are the so-called Silei dewitt equations. So it's a, it's a really powerful theorem of index, which relates an index of an operator. So just a purely uh, say operatorial uh, property with uh, some geometric invariants. Okay, and it turns out that these geometric invariants, well, the, the, the brilliant idea of Transcendent and Kohn was to, that these geometric invariants, they, they are just the elements of the action. So uh, this should be physics, okay? And uh, that's a picture that I found. And as far as I understand, it's, it was drawn by Kohn himself. I mean, it's, it's on a blog under a, uh, under a, uh, yes, a, a note which is, uh, which is signed AC. <laughs> Uh, so uh, yeah, they, they wrote uh, an article with uh, with Cham in in 2007, address for standard model with Beggar. Uh, then the editor of Physical Review Letters asked them to change the title because well, it's not maybe popular, but still it's it gives you the idea. Uh, and so the main idea is that this might be the answer to one of the questions, saying what's the structure, what's the What's behind the standard model? Okay, why is it so? Why is this action so complicated? Or why is it so and not a different action? Uh, and that's that that would be Kohn's answer that you need to take almost commutative geometry with a suitable algebra and, and then off you go. Okay, uh, but as I told you, uh, physicists, well, they maybe don't care so much about the dress, but they do care about numbers. And here, unfortunately, uh, they got the wrong number. So the original model predicted a Higgs mass of roughly 117 giga electron volts, which turned out not to be the truth because the, the, the value they measured at LHC was 125. And actually this value was excluded earlier by, by Tebatron accelerator in US. Okay, well, for me, it's still quite spectacular that you can, you can predict something from this model, something that was unknown, and you still get it, you know, you need to understand that the masses of elementary particles, well, they range, the giga electron of volts is like 10 to the nine electron of volts, okay? And the mass of an electron is, uh, uh, is what is like uh, 0 0.5 mega electron of volts, right? So that's, uh, there, there's a huge, mass hierarchy in particle physics. So if you just pick something at random, you will get, get it wrong by orders of magnitude. And here you get the same order of magnitude. So for me, it's really spectacular. I mean, given the number of, of assumptions and the structure behind it, but still it's not the right number. So physicists won't care. So then Con and Chamsedin, they, they realized that they overlooked some some additional field that was there, but they didn't take it into account. And they, they wrote a second paper in 2020, it's 2012 uh, saying that it's, uh, yeah, there, there is some missing part. Um, well, it's not so spectacular anymore because then if you introduce an additional field, you lose the predictive power. And well, you can tune it to, 1, 000, well, to 125 GeV of, of Higgs mass, but it's no longer a prediction, it's a post prediction. So. Uh, it's not that fancy anymore, but still it's a, it's a vivid domain and that's the main application of, of non-commutative geometry alacon in, in physics right now. So that's a, there's a whole book uh, of non-commutative geometry and particle physics by Walter Van Sulekum, which I highly recommend. 
and that's that's the idea that well saying that well we, we look some for some unified models so maybe there is as we know now that the higgs boson exists maybe there is another boson the sigma particle which provides another unification so this is something people explore uh, so let me also say that the spectral action predicts some modification of general relativity at the level of the action. So uh, the Einstein equations come from Einstein-Hilbert action. And if you write down the spectral action for, for gravity, which you can do, uh, you will get a slightly different action. So you get the Einstein-Hilbert plus some corrections. And these corrections, well, people look into it and see if it's, uh, well, what, what it says about, about the universe and uh, can we measure it in cosmic microwave background or gravitational wave data? So yeah, that's something people look into. Okay, so uh, let me conclude with the with the say my my personal take on on non commutative geometry and physics, uh, because well this this play around with uh, with almost commutative geometries and uh, and standard model that's that's all very nice, but. Uh, the really holy grail of physics is how to conciliate gravity with the quantum. This guy in the picture is Alan Kahn, right? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course, and he's holding the grail. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's really the big question, okay? And uh, nobody knows how to do it. Well, most people maybe would say that we should quantize gravity, but then comes Roger Penrose and he says, no, 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 it's quite the opposite. You need to modify quantum mechanics because of gravity. So you never know. And uh, I think that non-commutative geometry might play a pivotal role here. If not providing the final model, then at least that's inspiring some ideas. Uh, so first thing that comes to your mind is that, okay, we, we have the almost commutative geometry which governs the standard model of particle physics. But if it's almost commutative, then maybe it's just an approximation to something which is truly non-commutative. Now, what is it? Uh, and if there's such a thing, then what it means for, for quantum mechanics, for quantum field theory, quantum space-time, stuff like that. Okay, and um, for me, I think that the main challenge here to, to understand it is to go to pseudo Riemannian non commutative geometry. Uh, and uh, well, I can tell you it's, it's very hard and it's, it's very different. Uh, I think it's much harder than in the usual, in the usual classical case where you are going pseudo Riemannian is not a big deal. You just have a metric with, which have a signature with some <clears throat> minus sign. Here it's much different because, for instance, your Dirac operator on, on Minkowski space time. Uh, well, it has infinite degeneracy, so every eigenspace is infinite dimensional, which is good for physics because it <laughs> essentially means that the Dirac equation has solutions and <clears throat> has a lot of it. Okay, but but for mathematics, it's a nightmare because then it's well, you cannot you cannot make any reasonable spectral theory with these operators. So this is a big challenge, but. I think this is really essential if you, if you really want to reach for the holy grail. Okay, I think that would be right the time to conclude here. So let me leave you with some references. Thank you very much for your very beautiful lecture. All right, any questions from the room? Yes, I have a couple of questions. So if uh, we could go back to the slide with the spectral action, mm -hmm. uh, as far as I remember, the, uh, the powers of lambda, which appeared in this, uh, okay, could, could yeah, be here also, this one or this one. Uh, yeah. are bounded uh, by D, yes? So D is the yes. uh, higher, the highest power, but uh, you also allowed negative powers, yes? Yes. Okay. Yeah, actually, so the, if you're if you're on an almost commutative uh, spectral triple, then d is the well d is the dimension of the underlying manifold. So typically you want it to be four. Okay, if it's three uh, etc., then the second term is uh, and it goes by, by even powers. So there is no power three, and then there is power two, and then there's uh, power zero. And actually the the Einstein-Hilbert action is 
is this coefficient which sits here uh, proportional to lambda square. Uh, lambda four is, well, you can say the volume of the universe. Well, that's, that's, that's the constant. And uh, at the constant term, lambda to zero, you have all these actions of Higgs and uh, gauge bosons and stuff like that. Uh, and it's actually, right now I'm looking with a, with a friend of mine, with Arik Bochniak, we're looking into this lower, lower dimensional terms, seeing if there's anything interesting there. Because, well, I mean, the C Lake David coefficients, they, they are known, so you can just write them down. They, they are very complex if you go lower, but in principle, you can do it. Okay, so let me just say that this expansion, again, is something more general. It's not limited to almost commutative stuff. And this is a large part of, of my book is devoted to that <laughs> book with Bruno. If you have a P summable spectral triple, then D equals P, and you can still do the expansion. But then you might get some weird things like logarithm of this lambda or, or even complex powers of it. So you have some oscillations, and well, that would be interesting to understand what, uh, what, it, what it really means for physics. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a couple more questions. So uh, <laughs> if I could ask, uh, about um, okay what is uh, if we assume the existence of the sigma particle what is the, the perspective for uh, for experiments for discovering new physics in large hadron collider and so on well i don't well i i don't remember the exact numbers what i know is that it's it's not immediate in the sense that it's not they 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 are not going to, to exclude it as fast as they did with the with the higgs boson uh, because then you need to compute all these Feynman diagrams, etc., do the renormalization look thing. But but I know that that Walter is is looking into that, and there are some people from the CERN theory division that also did the computation and try to look in the data if if there's something going on or not. So yeah, I, well. I don't know, but yeah, also there are, there are a lot of different models like this supersymmetry, which some of them got falsified, some of them not yet, but uh, since, uh, well, the basic idea of supersymmetry is getting less and less popular, then, uh, well, it might be that, that people get more interested in these models. Mm -hmm. And let me just say that also Walter, did some different models. This um, it's called Pati Salam unification. So some 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 unified theory which has some even additional fields and new predictions. So anyway, so the, the punchline is that you can make a prediction. You can make a prediction and then go to the lab and see if it's wrong or right. Okay, that a different story is how easy it is to test this prediction. Well, typically it's not easy at all. But yeah, I mean, who knows. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm also curious about uh, this modification to general relativity, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So this would be on the large scale? Mm. Yeah, so uh, mm, this is because if you have the Einstein-Hilbert action, it's very simple. It's just the integral of the scalar curvature, right? And mm -hmm. if you vary that with respect to G, you get the Einstein equations. Okay, that's the simplest action you can think of in in relativity but then you can you can consider theories with f of r okay so any function of r would do and uh, and then well people looked into that and and um, so i from what i know there are two main directions one is in cosmology so people try to relate it to the so called inflation because there is a there is a hypothesis let's say some people say it's it's knowledge, but I follow Roger Penrose and say it's still a hypothesis that there was a period at the very beginning of the universe of inflationary expansion, exponential, driven by some unknown field, uh, which made our universe homogeneous and isotropic. That's what we observe. Um, but then nobody knows what is this inflaton field and how to see it. So one direction is that to look into these corrections that come from NCG and see, well, if it relates anyhow to inflation. Uh, 
and that uh, these are the works of, of Matilde Marcoli and Mairisa Calariadu and uh, the students, do, they did some, some research there. And the second thing is about gravitational waves. If you have some modified gravity theory, uh, well, you can see the difference, at least in principle, in the propagation of gravitational waves. Okay, so that's, that's how people look into it. Okay, thank you. And maybe last quick question. So should we view this uh, spectral action as an, a functional which is defined on the space of all Dirac operators or rather something like a, we take a, give, we have a, a spectral triple and then we consider all the fluctuation and this is a function functional on this space of fluctuated Dirac operators, but for a given spectral triple. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a very good question, and uh, hmm, you know what the right answer should be, because uh, I mean the, there is no such thing as a, as an abstract space of Dirac operators. I mean, if you don't have a spectral triple, then you don't even know what that should be. So I think you really need to start with a spectral triple. But then comes the question: Okay, about these fluctuations. So what what is your equivalence class of geometries? Mm -hmm. Uh, because these are some, say, usual fluctuations. And actually, uh, in some recent work by, uh, by Ali, Alain, and, and Walter from Sulecum, uh, they consider a more general form of fluctuations, uh, which do not come from this Morita equivalence, but it's something more general, but still they claim it gives you some equivalent geometry. And then you get something more general, uh, and then you have more Dirac operators, so you can have more physical fields and different models and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's for me at least, it's not completely settled what is the space of the operators on which you should you should vary this. Mm -hmm. But I guess you should at least fix your algebra and your Hilbert space, mm -hmm. and yes. then see all possible. Mm -hmm. Dirac operators for such two variables. So how to complete, you know, uh, two out of three, right? Principle. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I guess the same is classically. You fix your manifold, and then you look for your metric tensor, right? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for a beautiful talk. Anybody else? Okay. So uh, now, are there any questions from Zoom, perhaps? Any further questions? Okay, I don't see any raised hands. So in this case, uh, let us thank Michal again for his really, really very beautiful talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I stop recording. I encourage you to go onto our YouTube channel and uh, we already have five lectures uploaded and this lecture will be uploaded shortly. And we resume at 1100 hours. Thank you. <laughs>